the, the nature of some of these programs are, and you have this overclassification of records, that I had to make these kinds of judgments, which I think my, my worst research experience was in the Johnson Library, that these might be the classified records I wanted to look at. In some respects, they were based on the fact that the committee had, through its research at FBI files in Washington, come across certain programs and issues, and there's a certain time frame, so in a sense I made certain guesses about the classified records that might be relevant. The archivist of the Johnson Library advised me that, that, that Kissinger was particularly opposed, not simply to my, but it was opposed to the fact that what happened at presidential libraries of those who, who worked at presidential libraries with classified records, when a classified document is withdrawn, there's inserted a sheet that notes the name of the individual, the recipient, and the date. Kissinger thought that was giving away too much information. <laughs> As it turns out, what I found out is the vast majority of the classified records I singled out to be able to review was simply garbage. I mean, I could not understand why they were classified in the first place, leave alone why they remained classified by the 1970s. So the, the net result of this experience was that I don't think I did a very good job of uncovering information that would be valuable to the committee in trying to understand the relationship between the Johnson White House and the FBI. Well, this was a one-shot approval, and so I was not able to go to presidential libraries, but fortunately, William Sapphire wrote a column criticizing the Church Committee for defending the Kennedy administration. And so the, the committee staff goes to the White House and said, we're being beaten up because we're protecting Kennedy. You're not allowing our research to do research at the Kennedy Library. So they gave permission, same arrangement. I had to identify classified records. I would, could not take notes. I would send them over. But in this case, it was far more valuable because while I didn't think I came across anything of significance in the, in the presidential records aspect of it, the records of the Attorney General, because he was a brother of the President, were far more valuable, and I think that the net result of that is that it did add to the background information of value to the committee. Having been allowed to research two Democratic Presidents, uh, the committee asked if I could go and see the access information of the Eisenhower, which I ended up doing in December of 1975. So one problem, I think, was classification restrictions, limits in understanding. The second problem was the role of the Ford administration in trying to restrict the committee's ability to identify records that would be of interest. The third and last factor, I think, and here I'm speaking then more as an FBI historian, relates to the, the limited cooperation that the FBI provided to the committee. And let me cite some examples. The committee, in its review of Hoover's official and confidential file, came across this folder, the Black Bag Job Score. I don't know if you're aware of this, it was a procedure established in 1942 for authorization of the FBI's conducting branch Black Bag Jobs. And it was a memo created in 1966, the bottom of the memo, Hoover says no more such techniques be used. So that in a sense, what this memo established is that between 1942 and 1966, the FBI conducted domestic security black bag jobs. And the memo begins by saying that these are clearly illegal. So it's not a question of broad interpretation of presidential power. We can't obtain the authorization of the Attorney General. So here you have the FBI doing its own thing and establish this procedure that minimized the possibility of discovering that it was committing clearly illegal activities. The committee requests from the FBI information on the targets, the specific targets of, of FBI black bay jobs, and the number of raids the FBI conducted during the period 1942 to 1966. FBI officials responded, because of the nature of the do not file procedure, which ensured the destruction of, of break and authorization request documents, that there was no index file or document, and because of that, they were unable to answer specifically what the committee requests, but based on the review of records at FBI headquarters and recollections of FBI officials, the FBI conducted during this 40 to the 66 period 239 break-ins involving 15 organizations. Now, if you evaluate that, 
that would suggest that the FBI had used this with great restraint, and it had uh, used black bank jobs with respect to legitimate national security targets, Congress officials, suspected Congress agents. Well, as it turns out, the FBI was not being forthright with the committee because unknown to FBI officials at this time, and discovered in March of 1976, the head of the FBI's New York office, John Malone, had maintained in his office safe, despite the requirements of do not file procedure with record, record discussion, a massive file of records recording FBI break-ins conducted by the New York office between 1954 and 1973. Reviewing these records, I think this is a, a conservative estimate, the FBI from 1954 to 73 in New York alone conducted 433 break-ins involving 50, 250 to 300 different individuals and organizations. The basis for that imprecision is because the surreptitious entry file, as it's become known specifically, uh, it was massively redacted on its release, and so it's very difficult to ascertain whether a break-in was conducted to install a microphone or to photocopy records, which is a domestic security break-in. And because it's redacted, you can't tell if two memos involve two different individuals, organizations, or a repetition of that. But I give an insight into the scope of FBI break-in activities. The Socialist Workers' Party had brought suit in 1973 against the government because of disclosure of it being a target of one of the FBI's COINTELPRO uh, programs. And at the same time, they brought suit in violation of the constitutional rights. We had the release of the Houston Plan that disclosed that there were these series of activities that would be conducted, wiretaps, bugs, break-ins, mail only. So during the discovery phase, attorneys for the SWP requested all records relating to the FBI wiretapping of the SWP and all records relating to break-ins. U.S. attorneys responded, conceding that they had conducted break-ins based upon assurance of the FBI, maybe, maybe wiretaps, but denied that there were any break-ins. The discovery of the Malone file in March 1976 led U.S. attorneys uh, to advise the court that in point of fact, the FBI had broken into SWP offices between 1960 and 1966, 94 times. During the course of the trial itself, based on review of extant FBI records, that number proved to be limited. There was a concession that in New York alone, the FBI conducted 208 break-ins involving SWP offices and residents of SWP members, as well as the fact that there have been break-ins conducted in Newark, Detroit, Chicago, Milwaukee, and Boston offices, as well as Los Angeles and Hampton, Connecticut. So what we find out is that what the Church Committee did not learn is the targets of FBI break-ins. You learn about the policy, but in a sense what you have here is reflected in these records is the indiscriminate nature, relatively, of the FBI break-in operations. That these operations continued after 1966, which raised the question about Hoover's order banning break-ins, that they also included their use during criminal investigations caption in these memos established this was a criminal investigation, which raises a whole series of questions about the nature of FBI operation. A second file that the FBI did not provide the church committee was its National Security Electronic Surveillance Index. The FBI assigned symbol numbers to its sources as a means of safeguarding their identity. In the case of sensitive sources, there is an asterisk and a symbol number. A symbol number consists of the acronym of, of, of an office. CHI, Chicago, BOS is Boston. And then an asterisk would indicate, and what this index established is the targets of FBI break-ins, the specific name, organizations, individuals, the date of installation, the date of termination. I'm going to end soon. And so what you would have here is a tremendous finding aid which would have been of considerable value to the committee, enabling it to look into specific case files 
and to ascertain why a layer tamper or plug was established, what information was obtained, and what uses was made of that information. To summarize now, since I'm extremely good by time, what was not learned by the church committee was the nature and impact of FBI operations, which I'm not saying what if, but clearly that kind of record would have been a powerful record which established the value and necessity for stringent restrictions imposed by Congress and not by the executive branch. And in a sense, while I think the church committee did a very good job in terms of relative history, it failed to establish the kind of record that could have ensured uh, the kinds of reforms that I think its limited findings of 1975 established.